Good day, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 19. Did I get that right? Days all kind of flow together when we're having fun. Never a dull moment. Um, I know it's been a few days since we did a space. We had an epic one last Saturday. I was just too tired to do another one, so I um, <laughs> figured I'd kind of husband my energy a little bit here. We've got a fantastic room today. Albert Supporta who graced this room, uh, was, I think it was a month ago. Um, I've known Albert for over three decades. One of the sharpest minds out there. He marches to the uh, beat of his own drum. Uh, he's very quantitatively oriented in his approach, but he's able to meld that together with a coherent top-down view as well, a narrative. I'm just looking back, Albert, I see that we were together, I think it was the 18th, sorry, April 16, April 16, and you were pretty outspoken in your views at the time, and I'm sure it raised a lot of eyebrows, but man, have you been right? Um, you know, some of the folk, we have some of the sharpest minds in the business coming into this room, Michael Belkin, Michael Karenswitz, too many Michaels, yourself, I mean, just some incredible calls. And I'm reminded, uh, someone said the other day, we we're talking about, you know, if you're bearish, uh, you're a perma bear. No, I don't know you to be a perma bear. I, need, I know you to be mm, probably a skeptic, maybe is a better term. But the problem with being a bear is when you're right, they hate you. And when you're wrong, you're an idiot. And bears stand out because it's human nature to be optimistic. And so a market goes down, you stand out like a sore thumb, as opposed to if you're long, you're long and you're right, no big deal, everyone's long. If you're long and you're wrong, no big deal, everyone loses money together. So you kind of stick your neck out uh, when you take a bearish view. Uh, before we get to Albert, I really want to be about you. People don't come here to listen to me talk. Uh, markets are all over the place, but... You know, what's most noteworthy the last couple of days is Captain Obvious checking in the breakdown of the transports, the retail stocks. As we've been talking a lot about in this room recently, the first part of the bear market, I think Michael Cantritz really put it well, is all about multiple compression as uh, interest rates go up and credit spreads rise. Now we're getting to the second stage where the market starts to discount an economic slowdown, if not recession. And I was mixing it up this morning in some tweets and People are throwing tomatoes at me as usual. I, I just don't think the public has any clue as to what's staring them in the face. And Albert, you and I have been doing this about, long, about the same amount of time. I've never been as bearish in, in my entire life as I am now. And, you know, the massive... I, I still think there's complacency. I really do. Uh, I'll throw some charts up later, but uh, I was preparing a presentation the other day, and I was going through some data. It showed the commitment of traders' data both S&P and NASDAQ futures, they're net bullish. The put-call ratio was up. I mean, I know the CNN indicator is down. It depends on day of the week. But the bigger scheme of things, I think you have a bunch of uh, fully invested, um, I want to say bulls. I think they're getting the memo now. There's a problem. But, again, it's it's not what people say. It's what they do. And the public, you know, bought trillion, trillion three of equity last year. They hardly sold any of it. They're all in. Um, yes, professionals would de-risk to a degree, but I have a real problem with some of the positioning data. There's some uh, data out from Goldman Sachs, among others, and they show compared to the last two or three years, positioning amongst the hedge fund community is rather low, but that's really highly misleading. You need to zoom out a little bit, as our crypto our Bitcoin maxi friends would say, and look at the exposures relative to, say, maybe the last you know eight or ten years. I mean... 45% net long is, is the new flat, like heaven help us. And they were, they were at 75% net long. So I think people are still overexposed. Um, and, you know, we've seen rates go up a ton. I think earnings are now starting to fall apart. But I don't want to steal your thunder. So with that, um, Albert, uh, the floor is yours. Albert has prepared a bunch of slides. Um, we're going to get them up in the nest. Um, and so take it away, Albert. Um, you were spot on last time and I know we're going to have a very big room here today. So, um, go with that where you want. Albert, floor is yours. Uh, hi, George. Um, 
first uh, can, can you uh, can you hear me or, or you're right? perfect keep going you're good okay, great okay so uh thanks for the intro um yeah i, I guess uh, <clears throat> you know i wanted to start with the um you know you said you said you 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 know you've never been as bearish as you are right now and uh you know that's uh, i share the same uh, the same feeling and the question is why you know and i get asked the same question as well um you know i i mean i think markets can you know can and you know i'm pretty sure they will go down you know substantially uh, sub- substantially meaning a full cycle from overvaluation to undervaluation and you know the type of valuation adjustment that you need you know, to get to undervaluation is just mind blowing. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, of the order of, you know, 70, 80 percent, um, you know, similar to, uh, you know, to Japan in, in the uh, 80s, 90s and and similar to, um, you know, similar to, uh, I guess, Nasdaq 2000. So, you know, obviously nobody comes with that kind of uh, forecast, certainly not at, uh, you know, main investment banks. Uh, and and this is the kind of narrative that, um, you know, that you know, people kind of, uh, kind of avoid and, every, you know, everybody that I talk to is still pretty much in the, uh, you know, by the, by the dip or the Fed is going to come or, you know, this or that, whatever. But the, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess the, um, most of the investment uh, communities uh, is in uh, denial, which is, you know, which is the usual kind of state uh, at the beginning of a, of a bear market, which is, you know, which is where we are. Um Okay, so the first the first chart looks at the uh, the real earnings yield, um, which is the earnings yield, the inverse of the price earnings ratio minus the CPI rate, and that chart is just I mean it's it's of the charts. I mean the you know the, uh, the uh, this comes from um, Ed Yardini, and the uh, you know the last point is you know is below the uh, you know what's uh, below the chart basically, and if you looked at that chart you know th- three four months ago, we were kind of the same levels of 2008 and 2000, which, you know, which already was showing the market being very expensive. But now, you know, on a, on a, in terms of the real earnings yield of, uh, of the S&P is as expensive, I mean, it has never been, you know, as expensive as where it is now in the last, uh, what is it, 70 years. Uh, so it's more expensive than in the nifty 50s and, the, you know, in the inflationary, um, you know, decades of the 70s. You know, to the 80s, it's more expensive than in uh, in 2000. It's more expensive. I mean, not more expensive. It's substantially more expensive than 2000 and 2008. So, I mean, that chart just shows, you know, the kind of the kind of um, adjustment that you need to valuations, you know, for the market. You know, not you know even to get back to fair value would be a you know a gigantic um, adjustment in valuations. I mean, obviously, people can say, well, you know, inflation can can go down substantially as well. You know, probably the point is, you know, what's interesting in this chart is that, you know, what made uh, the 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 pink the pink columns on the on on uh, that chart denote um, bear markets, and so every time, you know, that you got to this type of massively overvalued uh, levels, you know, it's not a question whether inflation went up, down, or whatever. The point is, you know, you got the bear market actually every single time, in 1974. Uh, 2000, obviously 2008, and so we, you know, we we're probably facing, you know, a very very uh, severe uh, bear market. Uh, the second chart is, uh, uh, you know, uh, most of this uh, presentation, uh, you know, these charts reflate uh, um, turn around uh, inflation, and so the second chart is showing the uh, the earnings yield. Uh, uh, Albert, Albert, can I just interrupt yeah. for one second? Sure. Um, just so people are following along, because I put them up in the order you gave me. Um, what you refer to chart one is chart three, and, and it's just the numbers, that's all. Um, so it might yeah. be useful if you just refer to actually what it says, and it also corresponds to the number that you gave me, so it doesn't right. confuse people. Thank you. Okay. All right, so that was page three. So if we go to page four, uh, page four is, is showing the CPI and the earnings yield. Uh, so and the, two are going, uh, the two are going together. And you know what we see, obviously, the uh, the white line zooming up is uh, is the CPI, and the orange line is the uh, is the earnings yield. And there's obviously a, a huge gap uh, between uh, you know between the CPI and and the earnings yield. Why? What this chart is showing is that inflation is basically uh, creating P compression, and deflation is is creating 
P uh, inflation, um, P uh, expansion. And so, and so now we are in the phase where, you know, we should have significant, uh, you know, price earnings uh, compression, i.e. the earnings yield has to come up to meet, you know, to meet the inflation rate. So, and that's, you know, I put it on the chart. I mean, this is unescapable. I mean, the, the you know, the, uh, you know, it's something that's been observed uh, forever. Um, and the, uh, I mean, basically high inflation causes P, P compression and low inflation uh, causes P uh, expansion. And so it's no mystery that we had very high P's during all these deflationary uh, years. And so if we are getting into an inflationary environment, the P has got to be substantially uh, lower than what we've been accustomed to. Um, if we go to the next uh, chart, uh, page uh, number five, um, page number five is showing the uh, earnings per share of the uh, of the S and P since 1971, so the last 50 years, and you know we can see very clearly that basically uh, the earnings per share is going you know is going around a trend a trend line which is you know somewhere around the same as uh, um, GNP uh, GNP nominal growth, and whenever you get you know a little bit of a trend. I, you know, the economy is overheating, and EPS uh, are growing above trend. Then you get back to trend. You know, whether it was uh, at the at the end of the seventies, uh, nineteen eighty nine, uh, two thousand two thousand two thousand one, two thousand eight, and so on and so forth. And it, most of the time, uh, pretty much almost all the time, except in nineteen uh, in two thousand sixteen, the return to trend has has, uh, has been due to a recession. Okay, so now we are in 2021, 2022. Uh, you know, first of all, we, we see in 2020 a return to trend, which was, you know, which was caused by the, uh, the COVID crisis. And then we, we see this uh, humongous um, increase in the earnings per share way above trend. I mean, this is like three stand of deviation above trend. And again, you know, if we look at what happened in the last 50 years, uh, we know that, you know, whenever we get you know, too much ab above trend and, you know, too much is, you know, maybe one stand of deviation, you get back to trend and you get back to trend most likely, uh, you know, because of the forces of a recession. And so, you know, that chart is showing that the, you know, in a way, the, the probability that you would see a very significant decrease in the, uh, you know, in EPS, just to return to trend, I'm not even talking, you know, going below trend. But just to return to trend, we, we're talking about the 30% uh, adjustment in earnings per share. Again, you know, there's probably not one strategist in the street that's, uh, you know, that's talking about EPS in 2023 going down, you know, 20, 30%. But my guess is, you know, that there's going to be, you know, significant, a very significant decline in the, you know, in the uh, earnings per share of, of the S&P. Very likely because, you know, because the recession is around the corner. So, if we go back to the, you know, if we go back to the thesis that the price earnings ratio has got to, to compress because of inflation, so the, the P must come down, okay? But the denominator, the E, is going down as well, which is actually putting upward pressure on the price earnings ratio. It means that the P must come down even more to compensate for the, for the um, you know, for the decrease in the, in the earnings. So, you know, again, when we come back to the type of valuation adjustment that you need to go to go down to, you know, let's call it fair value, not even undervalued, you know, not only does the P must come down because of, uh, you know, of inflation. So the price earnings ratio has to come down, but it's, it's got to come down, you know, twice as fast, you know, because the E is going down. And, and, and if the E is going down, that's putting pressure on the on the price earnings ratio. On, so, on so, 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 Albert, just to summarize. Yeah. You, you've got PEs going down and you've got earnings going down at the same time. So lower PE and lower E means lower prices. Pretty simple. Yeah. But I mean, even, you know, much more than, you know, just the price going down. So the price go, has got to go down to reflect inflation, but it's got to go down to reflect as well the uh, the uh, decline in earnings per share. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And one question, Albert, just maybe just do a second here. So we see earnings like well above trend like this. Um, so what about, I mean, is it ever been in history that earnings 
can be this far above trend and not mean revert? I mean, if they don't mean revert, doesn't it mean that capitalism is, capitalism is broken? I mean, it's not possible they can stay up here, is it? Well, I mean, you know, I mean the only thing I can say is that it's never happened. Um, you know, right. it's, it's always, re- you know, it's always reverted to trend. You know, if they, if they were going to stay like that, it, you know, uh, I mean, they could, let's say they could go flat, you know, for a very, very long period of time until they, they need to trend. But it's, you know, it's never happened. Even in the, uh, you know, you can see in the in the late 70s, early 80s, I mean, they sort of went flat for a while. And then, you know, you had this uh, recession in the uh, in the early 80s, which right. caused them to, to go down to trend. Right. And every single time, you know, they, they, they did go down, um, you know, and as most of the time. And when they went below trend was, you know, was because you had a recession. Yep. That's great. Okay. Well, let's go so, on to the next. Let's, let's go uh, on to the next even, one. Even if you don't know anything about economy, you know, I would think that that chart is, is basically highlighting the fact that the probability that we get, a, you know, a recession is, is very high just because the earnings per share has got to return to trends, you know, one way or another. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next chart, I, I showed that chart the last time, but it's, uh, it's, it's a good one. Uh, and it, it could explain why, you know, why the uh, earnings per share is going to go, go back to trend or at least it's going to go down substantially. Um, so this is the S&P and then you got the uh, uh, the green line, which are the uh, profit margins, operating margins for the S&P and the um, pink line, uh, which is the price to sales ratio. And, uh, you know, what you notice is that the, uh, you know, I guess in, in, in the best of times, the operating margins were around 14%. And and they were kind of picking out, you know, pre-COVID. They were at at four, you know around forty percent in two thousand and fourteen, fifteen, and then they went down. They were trending down. Then the COVID came. Uh, the margins came down to uh, about ten percent, which which is in line with previous uh, recessions at the operating level. And then you got the you know the post-COVID uh, miracle, where the profit margins zoomed up zoomed up again, and and they went way above you know any other time you know, before in the last uh, 30 years and, and actually ever. I mean, uh, 2020, uh, 21 were record, um, you know, profit margins ever. And this, again, you know, this is this post-COVID miracle. I mean, I call it a miracle because it's, you know, you've never had, you know, such a huge, enormous uh, increase in, in profit margins, you know, way above trend. And, and again, you know, even if there was no, you know, inflation, there was no... Uh, you know, Russia invading Ukraine, whatever. I mean, you know, the, the, I mean, this kind of party time, you know, profit margins has got to adjust. And it's not just, you know, companies like Zoom and, and, you know, and whatever. I mean, all these beneficiaries of, you know, of the COVID economy. I mean, you know, these, these profit margins are way above trend. And, you know, my hunch is, I mean, there's no way they can, they, you know, they can stay there. So, you know, even if we were returning, you know, to, to the best of times, you know, that means profit margins coming from 16% to 14%. You know, that's a very big adjustment. And given the fact that we are at record price to sales ratio, I mean, we know that, you know, when you combine, you know, very high price to sales ratios and declining uh, profit margins, you know, that's the recipe for, you know, the price earnings ratio to, you know, to... Uh, no, bro, to bro, 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 you didn't get it, bro, bro. Kathy yeah. Woods, Kathy Woods, bro, you don't understand, bro. I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Albert, why, why don't we try to zo- speed all along a little bit? Just because you got so many charts here, I don't want to, I want to, you know, get people in the game. So um, maybe just try to speed it, or leave some of the charts out, or just speed up, just so we can get to questions a bit. Keep going. Okay. So anyway, so I mean, so that's the main thing. Um, that, that's the main thing I wanted to talk about is that the, the adjustment to, to valuation has got to be enor- enormous and, you know, they, they come from various pressures, which I, I just explained. The other very important, uh, um, you know, factor is interest rates. And, and in, the last, uh, in the last few months and certainly in the last few weeks, um, I, mean, the, the, I mean, the market is, is expensive relative to bonds. The earnings yield bond is, uh, is as stretched as it's ever been in the, in the last uh, 12, 13 years. And, and we've seen that in the last, uh, you know, in the last few weeks, you know, whenever the, uh, you know, whenever the bond market was diverging from the, uh, from the equity market, you know, you basically got the equity market, which, you know, which, which would be, uh, which would be crashing. 
So on page seven, you have you have the relationship between TLT, which is the 30 year uh, ETF, and uh, the S&P, uh, SPY and QQQ, NASDAQ 100. And, you know, the two are following each other. Uh, I mean, this is just the last six months. But if you, you know, if you look at it over a long, longer period of time, you would see that, you know, stocks are extremely high relative to relative to bonds. Uh, but the next chart is, is, you know, shows the short term, the last two months uh, on page eight. And the orange line is the, uh, the bond market. Uh, it's the 30 year futures. And the, uh, the white line is the S&P futures. And you can see, you know, I've put some arrows there, but basically each time the bond market would be, would be uh, going down, so meaning yields are going up, and the S&P would be uh, going up, then it was followed by, you know, a really bad day uh, for the market. So, so you see that around April 18, 19, there was a divergence between stocks and bonds. Then, you know, 21, 22, you know, stocks crashed. Then, you know, the last uh, few days of April, the two were together. Then again, in uh, in um, you know beginning of May, May three four, uh, the S and P goes up a lot. The bond you know bond market doesn't do anything. Then the S and P crashes. Uh, you know the the next three days. Then we got you know the two going together again. And then you know uh, a few days ago, the uh, you know the S and P was going going up. The bond market was going down, and then you know we got the crash of the last uh, of yesterday and the last I mean the last two days, and so we got this uh, you know you you can I mean it works like uh, clockwork really um, you know the I mean what this is telling you and what the chart before was telling you is that I mean you can't get any type of a rebound you know even a bear market rally you cannot get any bear market rally. Uh, on a sustained basis and sustain, you know, on looking at this chart, sustain means like a couple of days, really. So, <laughs> I mean, you cannot, you cannot get any rally in, in stocks if the bonds are not rallying as well. Um, okay. That's, that's the first thing. So, you know, people that would want to be playing, you know, uh, a rally, I mean, first of all, you, you know, you got to look at what bonds are doing. I mean, if bonds are, you know, going in the, in, you know, on, in the right directions, a yield going down, then maybe you can have a rally. And these are just rallies because, you know, I've shown before that anyway, you know, stocks are expensive relative to bonds and they're expensive anyway. But, you know, and, and the other implication of that is that, you know, if one really wants to be long equities, uh, you know, bonds is the lower risk uh, alternative at this point. Right. Or, or Albert, as you said to me the other day, you're saying the same thing a different way. If you're going to be, if, if you're not bullish on bonds, you can't be bullish on equities. Is that is that correct? You know, yeah. 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 Okay. All right. That's great. That's great. All right. So the next couple of charts are just showing how uh, QQQ is uh, arc is showing the way for QQQ, right? I mean, charts, charts. Uh, but, uh, and... Okay. The next few charts is just a little bit of uh, of uh, you know history in terms of what's going on. But what's going on is really is really important, which is you know I call that the the great asset liquidation, and and uh, you know on page nine. So I don't know if these charts are on on on. Twitter yet? But... Yeah, no, 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 we 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 have all the charts, Albert. All six, yeah, right. all here. Yep. Yeah, so on page nine, and it basically uh, February last year, uh, Arc, but it, it, not just Arc. It, you know the IPO ETF, which are you know all the IPOs, the SPACs index, Chinese tech, money losing companies. You know Goldman Sachs at this uh, at this uh, index of uh, of money losing tech companies. Um, you know growth stocks. I mean. Basically, all the peripheral, um, expensive, you know, very expensive uh, stocks, long, long dated assets uh, around the world uh, peaked in February, to, uh, in February 2021, almost to the days. I mean, all of them. OK, page 10. So people have been selling these things like crazy all of last year, uh, you know, meaning stocks going down 50, 60, 70 percent. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Nasdaq. At the end of last year, the NAS, uh, if you took away the the top five stocks, I mean the fangs of the Nasdaq, the Nasdaq was down forty percent, which is just amazing. Whereas the index itself was up. Um, so people have been selling these stocks like crazy. You know, stocks are going down fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty percent, and so on. Then came the end of last year, and uh, this time it was Facebook, Facebook, and uh, and Netflix. Uh, which got uh, dumped, uh, you know, by uh, sometime by twenty percent, twenty five percent a day. Um, 
so that was you know probably quite a shocker uh you know because it, it was the first time that the uh, you know mega cap uh, tech stocks uh were getting uh were getting hit by uh you know by uh massive selling um then on page uh, 11 actually that was uh you know that that was shortly after uh my call um you know a month ago then it, it went to amazon and google and Nvidia, and obviously, I mean, you know, the the rest of the of uh, of the tech space, and uh, and the rest of the market started to crack. But basically, you know, Amazon, Google, Nvidia started to go down. And then lately, it's uh, uh, you know Microsoft, Apple, and Tesla. I mean, these three have broken down as well. So you know, the uh, basically the uh, the uh, asset liquidation process is uh, is starting to widen to uh, you know to um, uh, to all the mega cap uh, tech stocks, and then the last two days, it's not just tech; it's uh, you know big retail, uh, Walmart, uh, Target, Costco, Home Depot. You know all these stocks are going down, and and when these things are going down, uh, you know because they miss a little bit or you know whatever the news is. It, I mean they they don't go down five percent or ten percent; they go down twenty five percent in a day, and then they continue to go down. Uh, so I mean, this is very typical of a liquidation process. It's you know, it's like uh, you know, take me out uh, at any price. Um, and so the question is, what's next? Uh, because that's you know, in a liquidation process, um, you know, it's not it's not going to stop there. Obviously, um, you know, if people accept that we are in a bear market and in a different type of environment, and and really the uh, you know the um, I mean, the market has been telling you what's going on, really. I mean, they they liquidating uh, asset classes one after or sectors one after another, and it's it's almost predictable. Um, and so, you know, what's what's next? This is on page uh, we know on page thirteen, okay. And I'm putting financial, industrial, real estate. I mean, financials are still still holding up in relative terms, certainly relative to tech, industrials. I mean, you can see uh, still see the prices of uh, Caterpillar, for example, which is you know pretty much near its all-time high. Uh, real estate, uh, meaning REITs, and uh, but also physical real estate. Uh, and then, you know, I think there's going to be a disaster. I mean, just a disaster in uh, in private equity. Uh, and why is pretty obvious because I mean, private equity has been the number one beneficiary of the last twenty years. You know, of the leverage economy and zero interest rates. Now, you know, I don't know what the business model is going to be for private equity firms. You know, when interest rates are going to be, you know, three, four, five, six, seven percent. I mean, you know, the whole, uh, you know, the whole mod- model is uh, is uh, thrown out of out of the window. So, I have this uh, pretty pretty neat chart uh, on the top on page thirteen, which so shows Blackstone's relative to the S and P. Basically, basically Blackstone. Um, and you could put, you know, other other players, including Goldman Sachs, or I mean, it wouldn't be so spectacular. But you know, these are high beta, uh, high beta, uh, you know, market uh, players. Uh, you know, because they leverage everything they're doing. So when the you know when the market goes up, they go up more. When the market goes down, they go down more. And you know, what's quite incredible on these charts is you could see. You know, it kind of looks like the EPS and, and and the trend I was showing before. I mean, you know, like the, the S and P is the trend, and when things get really good, you know, Blackstone, you know, does a lot better, and so you do have spikes relative to the S and P, and then, you know, uh, Mr. Market comes in, and you know, the, the, you have a retracement, retracement like you've seen in 2015, 16, and then, you know, the market goes crazy, really crazy, and then you get the the spike and the the overshoot. Uh, in 2019, which started again, Mr. Market comes in, and during the COVID crisis, the two converge again, and then the madness of you know 20, 2020, 2021, where the gap between the S&P and and Blackstone has never been you know so so enormous, and so you know I suggest that the uh, you know the next shoe to drop in you know in these uh, you know in in this liquidation is going to be the financials. Uh, probably led on the way down by these, uh, you know, by these private equity firms, you know, the Blackstones, KKR, you know, all these things, um, uh, Brookfield, uh, Macquarie in Australia. Um, you got uh, EQT in Sweden, which is a huge private equity shop partners group in Switzerland. I mean, these things have come down quite a bit actually outside of the U.S. But Blackstone is, you know, is pretty much near its uh, its high, and then, 
And then the chart that you've got below Blackstone is is uh, Bloomberg's index of uh, of you know private equity fund NEV. Uh, this is the black line and the S and P, and it's the same the same story. I mean, these guys, the private equity fund, are not doing a much better job than the S and P. Except you know the only one difference is that the business model is better because they raise uh, permanent uh, capital uh, and people you know, can't get out uh, when they want to. Uh, and so, you know, I think this is going to be a disaster. Um, you know, if the market really takes takes a beating, uh, I don't know what kind of haircut, you know, the, the these private equity funds are going to take. And the same goes for venture capital as well. But, you know, I suspect it's, it's going to be of the order of 20, 30 percent, maybe more. And so, you know, people are, you know, are going to be shocked, I think, by that. And and that will feed, you know, because these things are illiquid, you can get out, you know, whenever you want. Um, you know, so people will, I mean, there's been, you know, I don't know the numbers, but I mean, it's zillions of dollars have been raised in private equity funds, you know, which have been sold to, um, you know, private banks, uh, um, um, family offices and so on. But also they've been, they've been sold retail. I mean, there's been a drive actually to uh, democratize uh, private equity and and you know these things have been ending up with the you know uh, with the wrong people, and so you know I suspect and I'm pretty sure you know that's going to be the case uh, because it's it's impossible to avoid. Uh, you know people are going to be stuck in illiquid uh, investments and what what are they going to do? Well, they will continue to sell the liquid stuff. So you know the uh, the uh, the uh, all these investments in you know what I call roach motels. You know you check in, you never check out. Uh, this is going to exacerbate the uh, the selling pressure on the on the liquid on the liquid stuff. Okay, so sounds good. Also add, you also had the PDCs in it, the BizDev companies. They're highly levered listed entities such as Carlyle Group as one. There's one from Goldman Sachs as GSBD, uh, so on and so forth. Would you also add that that to this list on the financial side? What's that? Sorry. Would you also add the business development companies, BDCs, which are publicly listed? Uh, right, okay. BSBD, um, because they're highly levered, right? They're right. basically just a front shop. Okay. I, I'm, I mean, I look at it. I'm actually not familiar with these. Uh, yeah, so, 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 Churn Wizzle, just hold that one, because I think Albert, um, I don't think it's area of his expertise, so it's a good question, but I just don't think that's what he can follow those stocks. Albert, you want to just clean up, finish up the last couple of slides so we can get to a, a open, yeah, so, open uh, discussion? Uh, you know, so wh where do you go in this type of environment? Um, so that's page 14. And I love e ESG investing. Uh, ESG is uh, energy, soybeans, and gold. Um, so that's what, I, you know, that's what I would be looking at. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, the chart, uh, there are three charts. They're, they're a bit smaller. I wanted to put them all on one page, but um, I mean, lots of people have seen the first, the, the top chart, which shows capex in the oil industry and and the the price of oil, and you know the the short story is that capex has gone has gone down the drain in the last ten years, uh, which looked like a, a pretty good a pretty good idea uh, until until the end of COVID, and obviously, I mean the very the very uh, big lack of capital spending, you know, when when oil is at one hundred dollar plus. And and you you know we've got uh, we we've got huge supply disruptions, uh, you know because of uh, of Russia. Uh, I mean there's you know there's there's got to be uh, you know a huge drive to find to find more oil, uh, and also you know investment had been drying up because of the uh, real ESG investing, and that's you know that's probably going to be you know a dramatic mistake actually, uh, and so there's probably going to be a rush of investment in the uh, in the space. And probably the uh, you know I'm not sure if I would be you know buying the um, uh, the majors, but certainly the E and P companies and the uh, oil services which are even more depressed. I mean they've gone up a lot, but they're very depressed over uh, over long periods of time. Um, you know that's an area to go. Um, I've explained that last time. I mean I, I tend to do that on a hedge basis, but probably you know long term you know buying these E and P companies and 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 uh, oil services companies probably a, a good idea. Uh, the next area is uh, is gold, which is uh, a little bit struggling right now. But uh, you know, the when you look at the mining stocks, uh, the gold stocks are the uh, are the cheapest ones. And and if we are in an inflationary environment, um, and especially with geopolitical uh, uncertainties, uh, I cannot 
I cannot think of another uh, area to be in. And then, uh, you know, soybeans, uh, which means basically agriculture. Um, uh, there are some, some, some very interesting plays in uh, Argentina among ETF. I've, I've put the names of the, of the main ETFs uh, on the right, uh, the, the Argentinian ones. Uh, Argentina goes from boom to bust all the time. They, they were in the bust. They, they're going into the boom phase right now. Um, and it's totally decorrelated to, uh, to world markets. I mean, uh, you know, these things can have a, a life of their own. Uh, Brazil is also very interesting, uh, and especially the, uh, you know, the currencies. Uh, I mean, the Brazilian currency, um, short-term interest rates in Brazil are around 12%, 13%. So the, uh, the carry is like uh, over 10%. Uh, and they benefit from, uh, from higher inflation, higher commodity prices, and so on. Uh, so that's, you know, that's an area to, to hide. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the best place to hide tends to be uh, tends to be cash, and low and low exposure, uh, especially in the, you know especially if, if we do get the kind of bear market that I'm that I'm thinking of, and 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 obviously being uh, being short. I mean that's uh, uh, you know that's obviously something that's working uh, in a bear market. So uh, you know we come to uh, the last page. Um, on page 15, uh, you know, to conclude. Um, so where we are right now, we, we, we uh, actually, I, I put up the chart in a presentation a month ago, and most of the points are still valid. A month ago, it was massively overvalued markets. We're not massively overvalued anymore, but we overvalued enough, certainly. Uh, we're still at the beginning of a tightening cycle. I mean, you know, if, if you, uh, you know, if you believe the, the Fed, uh, and and if you look at at inflation, I mean, it's clear that uh, we're at the beginning of the tightening cycle, uh, and so uh, you know that's a worry. Uh, raging inflation, the Fed is clearly behind the curve. It's probably going to stay behind the curve, and the, you know, the, so that's uh, that's not a good environment. Then you got these uh, these um, geopolitical uh, issues, uh, which are you know which are. Uh, certainly um, uh, huge deglobalization uh, which is which is leading to contracting uh, global commerce declining growth declining mar margins <clears throat> i like to say you know if the world is getting uh, smaller so will uh, the earnings per share um, and and we got you know i mean I, I i this was a month ago possible recession on the horizon uh, but it looks like the recession is a, is a foregone conc conclusion i mean you know i think there's very little little that we're going to get that um, possible further COVID disruptions, and certainly in China, which you know closes uh, cities after cities. Uh, and if it's you know if it uh, goes away, it's probably going to come back in the fall again and winter. And and there we are, and we are at a at a point where equity markets, okay, they you know they down twenty percent, you know from the high. Uh, but given the environment uh, and given the asset liquidation that's taking place. Uh, I think we're way, way, you know, uh, very far away from, you know, from from any kind of a bottom, uh, except you know possible bear market rallies, which you know, which I think will be uh, indicated by the uh, by the bond market, as I said before. Um, but you know, if we look at the little chart on the on the on the left, uh, a month ago, mid-April, uh, we were, you know, the, this is the the, the sort of uh, psychological uh, cycles. Uh, in bull and, and bear markets. And so, you know, we were uh, exactly at the new, new paradigm at the peak of, you know, 2021. You know, the, uh, I mean, everything was going crazy. The MEM stock, uh, NFTs, uh, metaverse, you know, all these crazy things. Then the market starts to go down. Uh, then we had the, uh, maybe we had this bear market rally uh, mid-April. Uh, you know, it was not uh, maybe a big enough fall and not a big enough uh rally but maybe we were there but certainly now and if we if we do see you know uh, every, every i mean the, the market looks like a, a land a, a landmine a landmine field uh, you know every day there is like a something that blows up uh amazon google uh target you know you know tomorrow's going to be something else so you know i think this is going to instill fear among investors so we're going down the fear you know the fear curve if you will uh, and certainly, you know, if, if I mean, actually, the the chart of Apple looks uh, looks awful, and it's it, it is it has already bro uh, broken down, uh, and so maybe that's going to accelerate on the downside. And the same is true of Microsoft and Tesla, 
uh, and maybe I'm going to be right on Blackstone and, and uh, you know, maybe the financials are really going to, uh, you know, to take a bath. So, you know, we, we are probably in this uh, entering into this fear, uh, you know, um, phase, which is actually the, uh, you know, which is the one where, I mean, the shorts really, you know, make a lot of money because things, you know, things are just, you know, puking all around, uh, all over the place. Uh, and, 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 and the other players tend to be paralyzed because, you know, they see stocks going down and, and, you know, they can't do anything because they say, well, you know, it's down already 20 or 30%, you know, what, what should I do? Uh, and it goes on and it goes on. And then finally you get to capitulation, but we, you know, we obviously we're not there yet. So anyway, so, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to say. I mean, uh, Al, Al, yeah. Albert, that, that, that's terrific. I mean, you covered so much ground. Uh, it's just wonderful. I could I could listen to you talk all day. So let me start with a couple questions. Um, what what would you tell? Just picking up on the last thing that you were talking about, for the average investor who maybe you know, owns index funds or has been dollar cost averaging and has been told by their financial advisor, you know, don't don't change your asset allocation, don't sell, you have to pay taxes or don't sell because if you sell, you're going to have to get back in. For the average investor, not a not a sharp full time professional like you, but for the average investor, what advice would you give them? Would, would you think it's going to work out in the okay in the long run? Do you think there's a lot of downside? You do we just go to cash? Like what what advice would you give the average investor? Now look, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I really think, um, you know, I really think that we, we're not going to see the peak, you know, that we've seen in 2021 in in you know in uh, in a few years, um, I don't see any environment where where we can you know where we can get into that kind of uh, uh, where we can get back to where we were uh, last year. Um, so I mean the 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 advice is uh, is uh, you know is is actually to you know to lighten up. Um, now the question is you know are, do you want to lighten up now? Do you want to lighten up? You know wait for some kind of a rally. You know I have no idea. I mean it's a, you know it's a very very difficult call uh, because. I mean, you can get a twenty percent rally anytime. In fact, you know, for example, the the Nasdaq uh, in in um, in two thousand went down. Um, I think it went down forty percent in in one straight go, uh, pretty much, and then it went up. Uh, it, it went up forty percent. So you can you know you can get some you know pretty big um, you know bear market rallies. Certainly, the advice. I mean, my advice is that you know if there are any rallies. Uh, I would be selling and I would be, you know, particularly selling on any type of rally, whatever small it is, if the bond market continues to go south, okay. or, you know, interest Thanks. rates going yeah. up. And, 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 and another question. So it's not just that if we were just spitballing and, and, and throwing darts, how low looking at a year or two do you think the market go? Let's just pick the S&P or NASDAQ or whatever instrument you want to choose. How, how, how much do you think the market could go down? I mean, could it go down ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent, fifty percent? I mean, I'm not going to hold you to it, but I'm just trying to calibrate your bearishness. And, uh, I'm, I'm taking bets, uh, George. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 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 I, I think I think peak to trough. I think I think it's going to be more than fifty. So if we were forty eight hundred, that would mean twenty four hundred on the S and P or something yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So on that happy note, um, let's go to some of our smart uh, questioners here. We're going to go to Trend Wizzo first and then Philip. Trend Wizzo, the floor is yours. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you for the slides uh, which you put up, Billy. Uh, this is really helpful uh, contextualizing the whole sequence and series. Uh, from your standpoint, from the shoes to drop, right, uh, going back to the credit market discussion, you had mentioned about not just the financial sector, but a broader credit section. What are some interesting uh, con- high convexity plays uh, which uh, one can participate in? By the way, I have been also on the same camp as yours, so shorting the rips uh, since January. I've been trying to follow what George has also uh, been, you know, uh, giving counseling to most of the folks about flat or short, flat or short. <laughs> George, I remember that phrase of yours. I do use it uh, uh, at places <laughs> because I'm actually implementing it. So from Billy, your standpoint, could you elaborate and tease out more about the credit markets and what shoes uh, we could see dropping and how we could uh, translate it into high convexity trades? 
Uh, in the in the credit market, you said. Yes, yes. For individual investors, how would we translate into high convexity trades in the credit markets? Yes. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, Albert, you don't really do credit much, do you? No, no, no. No. All right. So I guess Trent was have to say save that question for uh, for someone more expert. Yeah. Um, let's go to Philip and then so hey, Philip, what's up, Philip? Hey, George. Um, thanks for the space. Albert, um, some brilliant observations here. My, my question for you is um, on slide number five, when you talked about um, this sort of relationship between price and earnings. And what occurred to me here is how much torque could this decline provide on the downside, right? So far, we've had a couple of kind of ugly-ish days. They weren't as bad as, as March 2020. But this peak seems to be almost twice as high as the previous couple of peaks. Uh And I'm just curious if you've given any consideration or thought about um, as earnings collapse, which, you know, we're already seeing some of that. You pointed out with, uh, you know, the margins in the retail uh, sector. What kind of torque could we potentially see here on the on the downside? Look, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the chart is just there to, you know, to. um, to illustrate what's you know like like all charts what's been happening before so you know I, I, you know the the the, uh, the answer is i don't know what I, you know the only thing i would say is you know i think it's 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 coming you know how it's coming why it's coming uh you know which sectors are going to be you know affected the most and so so on you know i i have no idea you know the only thing i can i can i mean there's so many charts actually that look the same i mean you know whether it's uh, the price of real estate uh, the Fed's balance sheet, um, you know, whatever, whatever. There's there's been something exceptional that's that's happened post COVID, you know, which has which has taken, you know, a lot of indica- uh, economic indicators way off the chart, and and you know, at minima, I think you know there is going to be a, a sort of you know, it's like a a post you know post party uh, hangover basically. Yeah. Uh, no, for, for sure. What. What strikes me on this particular chart is if you look at some of the other downsides there, uh-huh. you know, look at March 2020, right? The downside there is spectacular, but we're starting from, I don't know, it looks like 200, 230% of the previous high. And, you know, meanwhile, I'm talking to, you know, former colleagues of mine and friends in high tech and SaaS, and, you know, they're still holding on to their, their company stock and it's down 50, 60%. Yeah. They haven't sold yet. Right. Uh-huh. I, I bumped into another guy who owns some crypto and some GBTC. He didn't know what Tether was like, uh-huh. you know, George has been been beating the drum. Right. Like, you know, we haven't hit bottom yet. And you, you hear people all over Twitter talking about, you know, is this a good time to buy? And I'm just I'm, I'm flabbergasted that people aren't thinking about the fact that no one's sold yet. I mean, the selling hasn't even started yet. Yeah, and then Philip, that's the key point. And, and again, that quote from Walter Deemer: "It's not when everyone turns bearish that's important. It's it's it's, it's when they're done selling." And there's hardly been any selling. I mean, it's been minimal. So it, it's it's just uh, God. Philip, stay on stage. We'll come back to you. Let's move it around. Let's go to Sohaib and then uh, Dave Nikoski. Sohaib, um, Billy, uh, the question for you is: you know, you mentioned the ESG is the best place to be. Um, and um, you know, if we have a larger drawdown, larger recession, which is, it seems that you know may, may be the case, how how bad do you think is? I mean, they would all get you know may, maybe not equally hit, but they, they'll all get hit. So you know, how bad do you think it would be relative to um, you know pre- based on previous cycles or um, previous times when, when when things get hit? That's my question, uh, Billy. Thanks. How about the uh, the energy or gold w- would uh, would go in a, in a sell off? Is that what you said? Yes, yes. I mean, they're not going to get hit as bad as everything else, but I mean, so, just, uh, right. Okay. okay. So, uh, okay, energy is uh, energy is the tricky one, uh, you know, because the uh, you know it's difficult to know what you know what the oil price would be doing in a, in a recession. I guess you know most likely it would go down. So, um, you know, it's very likely that that the energy sector gets uh, gets hit. Uh, and that's why, actually, in uh, you know earlier, I said I tend to prefer to you know to go in to go in that sector on a on a hedge basis. 
uh, and there are, you know there are ways to do that. Gold is a gold is a different story. Uh, and if you look at uh, previous sell-offs, uh, whether it was two twenty, uh, you know, two thousand twenty, or or uh, two thousand and eight nine, um, you know, gold and gold mines gets get sold off in all this in all the sort of selling climax. But then you know it comes back very very quickly, and in the end, you know, that performs. So I think, you know, I think. Um, uh, and if you look at the, you know, the relative performance of gold mines relative to the S and P, it's, you know, it's way at the, bo- at the at the bottom, and it's really on a, you know, on a, on the runway. So I'm not as as worried about gold on an absolute basis and gold mines uh, than I would be on, you know, on, on the uh, energy stocks. Right. Thanks for that, So hey, Before we go to um, David Dave Mikoski, uh, there was a question that was sent to me, Billy. Um, you mentioned your opinion on gold and gold stocks. What do you think of silver? What do you think of silver? Well, silver is uh, is the uh, the high beta gold. So uh, you know, if gold goes up, silver is gonna you know silver is gonna go up uh, more. The, the one thing that worries me a little bit is that silver actually broke down uh, a few days ago, and so and so it, it you know it, it it could go down and drag and drag uh, uh, gold lower. At the same time, it's uh, you know it's uh, you know when you do have breakdown, but in a in a kind of bull market, uh, they can be forced breakdown. So I'm not, I'm not putting a lot of uh, importance to that. So if gold goes up, uh, you know the short answer: if gold goes up, silver goes up more, and if gold mines go up, silver silver mines go up even more. So I like them. Thanks so much. Okay, so Mr. Nikoski, good to see you. It's been uh, three or four weeks since you're in the room. You. Had a great call on uh, the resource stuff. Um, so welcome. Um, I don't know what's on your mind. You got a question for Albert, so the floor is yours. Yeah, I abs- I absolutely uh, agree with Albert, and I think it goes along with what our discussion was back on April 9th. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned at that time was, you know, Amazon was a delivery company, and they're going to get hurt pretty hard with diesel prices, and, you know, that may be uh, part of the factors for, for the decline. I d- actually didn't read through it. Um, you know, one of the things that, and so I, I agree, you know, we're in a bear market. Um, you know, my job is doing relative strength analysis is to look, look around the world and see other places to, uh, look at and see what might be outperforming, you know, and, and I'm, I'm probably going to get a little slack in here because, you know, no one wants the Chinese stocks, you know, the K webs of the world and the FXI, I know it's dangerous, but you know, it's actually outperforming the NASDAQ composite for the last several months. Um, the absolute chart looks horrible, but, you know, I'm looking for relative strength and saying, hey, what what are the factors that may contribute? Hey, N- to- Nikoski, I'm going to bust your chops. Yeah. Relative strength. Why don't you get long tether? That's outperforming NASDAQ, too. No, I, I don't <laughs> believe in tether. And I, I don't believe in crypto. Oh, oh, I mean, oh. I, Nikoski, I oh, hey. whoa, 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 whoa. You got a narrative now. The relative strength of tether, it's outperforming. Yeah. Oh, that, now it doesn't I, suit your book. <laughs> well, and that's why I said I'm going to get slack for this. And I'm going to no, go. No, no. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, yeah. you're dumpster diving, dude. Certainly, uh, let me ask a question. No, about I'm not saying buy it. That's not my That's not my point. My okay. point is, <laughs> is there's a lot out there that is working. And I agree with Albert when you look at some of these South American stocks. You know, I, I sent you a few days ago, you know, the Brazilian real is making a huge top against the dollar. And it, it, it's got so much overhead supply. Anyone that does technical analysis is going to see a major top. You know, they do have, they're at 12, you know, 0.75% interest rates. If inflation does come down, and here's the big F, you know, China has just decreased the value of the one by 7% over the last five weeks. In 30 to 60 days, Shanghai has got 90% of the capacity of the ports open right now, today. You're starting to see loadings. You're going to start to see at least PPI come down in 60 to 90 days. I'm just saying there's a possibility we'll see lower inflation. The problem is, in my opinion, is oil prices are going to stay unusually high. And they're probably going to go a lot higher than we're sitting. There's a huge underinvestment of capital in there for the last few years. It, it is 2002, 2003 all over again. Combined with the bubble that we had in, you know, in 2000, um, that after that, you know, we emerging markets did phenomenal. If you look at, you know, something like EWA, which is the Australian ETF, you're breaking a 12 year downtrend in relative strength on it. 
you are in EWC as well, which is Canada. You know, I do think that Brazil was one of the biggest beneficiaries. Albert mentioned soybeans. Who's one of the largest producers of soybeans in the world? Yeah, Dave, 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 Dave I should warn you. Uh, Albert, Albert's lived in Brazil for a fair bit, so yeah, he, he, he knows more than just enough to be dangerous. So, Albert, do you want to talk about one of your, you know, favorite old girlfriends, the Brazilian market? Like, like, what, 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 what's your take? Uh, forget about the charts. Just like, sort of, there's an election coming up. You know, commodity prices moving around. Like, what's your sort of takeaway from, you know? You know Brazil really well. I mean, so- no, I think you know. I think the I mean, investing in Brazil and and uh, you know, let's put away Argentina because that's uh, you know it's um, arcane kind of, kind of thing. But Brazil is is you know the way you make money in Brazil is is you know getting the uh, the market right, but also getting the currency right. And and you know I, I think the uh, the currency is very undervalued. And, and uh, the I, I didn't get you know what. Uh, uh, Michael was saying on the chat whether the, the Brazilian real looked like toppy or or was actually to to you know to move up. But it, I mean, to me, the uh, the chart of the real against the dollar looks uh, amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So let me just let me just interrupt here. I think I'll be switched on this one. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, you got to turn the Brazilian chart upside the real upside right. down yeah. because mm-hmm. you might want to explain that. So so Dave, when you're talking about the chart rolling over, that's really the real going yeah. up, not down. So you guys are saying that's the correct. same. Th- you guys are saying the same thing. Right. Okay. Everyone yeah. in the room may not be understand that. So, um, okay. so the real real looks like it's going to appreciate against the dollar, and then you get the uh, you know the, yeah. uh, the carry. Yeah. And that's you have you know, Australia at three year relative strength highs against the S and P right now, and. You know, from what I see, this isn't going to be an emerging market. You're going to have these emerging markets climb in their weighting within the EEM. And that's the same thing that happened from the 03 to 09. Mm-hmm. 100%. 100%. I, I would, I, you know, I'll just say a word on the on the Chinese uh, on the Chinese stocks. Because um, actually I got I, I, I got creamed uh, on the Chinese stocks. Uh, I got in a little bit early uh, thinking that they were cheap. And... Um, and the, and you know Chinese tech stocks you know do look uh, you know very cheap and you know whatever stock you look at in in uh, actually the Chinese tech companies are making money uh, they tend to have you know tons of cash on the balance sheet in fact you can buy a lot of them uh, you know trading for less than cash uh, yeah. you know their their cash in the balance sheet and so on and so forth the big problem but, is whether the accounting is is good because yeah, I mean, obviously you know, yeah, that's yeah, the biggest uh, concern now sure, I took a look at. KWeb, but, and they've already removed 80% of the names to the Hong Kong exchange, so they're not even fine. trading the ADRs anymore. Fine, but I mean, the you know, the, the point, uh, you know, the uh, I think the Russia, uh, you know, the Russia story is, uh, I mean, I think is a big lesson in terms of, uh, you know, the kind of risk that you take when you oh, invest. absolutely. In, when, you, when you invest in, in jurisdiction where, you know, anything can happen, you know, particularly in, you know, in places like you know, uh, you know, which uh, which are quasi, you know, di- dictator. So the, uh, you know, I wonder, um, you know, I wonder whether, uh, you know, I wonder what kind of discount uh, you require to, you know, to invest in uh, in China. And and you know, these days when when you you know you look at the tech, you know, if you look at uh, tech stocks in the U.S. and probably when you're going to look at tech stocks, let's say in six months time. Uh, you know, and they they might be you know a lot lower than where it is right now. In a way, I don't see the point in you know going to China when when you'll be Absolutely. able to pick up you know some pretty cheap stuff. You know, again, I was I was trying to add perspective. No, no, sure. If you're bottom fishing tech, realize China actually looks better on the chart. I'm not suggesting go buy yeah, yeah, it. No, I mean, yeah, yeah. That's but my I mean, you know actually the 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 chart of KWeb is kind of the same as the chart of uh, Arc. Uh, you know, it's very very similar. That's great. Okay, let's. Um, th- thanks, thanks for that, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Always, thanks, always, 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 always good to see you. And please, uh, yeah. I'm glad you popped in. We got to get you back in here as a speaker again before too long. I would love what, to do it. Again. Yeah, let, let's go to Igor. Uh, Igor, the floor is yours. What's up, Igor? Uh, hi, George. I want to thank you for the space. It's a great space, and as usual. And my question is all related to investment in Brazil and Argentina. I've been excited about it, especially since the war started, because, you know, obviously the, you know, major producers of grain are Russia and Ukraine. So I was looking at Brazil that could capitalize on that market. But then what started happening is the dollar 
started picking up and it got very strong. And then all those trades or all those, you know, uh, agricultural uh, uh, agricultural places like AGRO started just collapsing because that debt is in, denominated in U.S. dollars. And we should not, what I understood is that you should not be investing in emerging markets when the U.S. dollar is strong. Can you please comment on that? Yeah, so I think you got to be careful. Um, emerging markets are a very heterogeneous group. You have some countries which are uh, very indebted and some which are creditor countries. That's one thing. And I'd also say that compared to past emerging market cycles, yeah, there are some notable exceptions. I mean, Argentina screwed up, Turkey's a basket case. But generally speaking, balance sheets, I believe, and Albert will bear me out on this, most emerging market countries, you don't have the same financial stress that you had in past cycles. The balance sheets are generally better. So you've got to really, you got to differentiate. I mean, you have, you have a place like Brazil where I don't think there's a lot of financial stress and rising commodity prices are positive. Then you have a place like Turkey where it's all screwed up and they're actually hurt, not helped by rising commodity prices. I maybe walk in thin ice on that one. But the point is they're not, they're not all created equal. So Albert, what would your comment be about the impact of the strong dollar on emerging market countries. No, yeah, I mean it would be it would be. A, I mean your your example, be, you know, between Brazil and Turkey is exactly uh, is ex exactly correct because in in the great scheme of things, you know, the Brazilian real has, has been appreciating, and uh, you know there, there was a pullback in the last uh, in the last few weeks, but generally the uh, you know the, the the real has been doing all right, whereas the you know the Turkish lira, for example, has has collapsed and continues to collapse. So the um, yeah, uh, I think, uh, you know, you've got to differentiate in, you know, emerging markets and the one which are, uh, you know, beneficiaries from inflation and the one which are, you know, which are not beneficiaries. And clearly, uh, Latin America, it's not just Brazil, but it's, you know, it's it's the whole, uh, the, the whole uh, uh, continent, uh, you know, whether it's Mexico as well or Colombia and Argentina, of course, they are beneficiaries of uh, inflation because they are, you know, commodity producers. Yep. Uh, so I think, you know, I think that that space that space is fine and actually you know i, I think latin america as a, as a, as a, you know as a as an area is probably going to uh, to outperform asia and uh, you do have you do have etfs that cover the whole you know the whole of latin america uh, or you have obviously um, you know brazilian etfs as well but you know i think you know that's a that's a pretty good uh, a pretty good place to be certainly in terms in in relative terms so let's just take a break here for one second and reset the room. Um, Al, we have Albert Supporta, a longtime, uh, very shrewd uh, global investor. Um, he is working out of uh, either Switzerland or Israel, depending on uh, what week or month it is. Uh, Albert runs a research service, uh, AIMR. It's over 25 years old. Uh, if anyone's interested in his work, please reach out to him. Um I'm sure he wouldn't be adverse to uh, having some more clients. But uh, again, I have no commercial relationship with Albert. I just know him, known Albert for many years and one really shrewd cookie. And, you know, I enjoy reading his stuff and he's a money maker. So if anyone's interested, reach out to Albert. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm sure he'd be interested to speak with you. The other thing I would say, um, you know, again, as, as we all know, been, people have been in this room. We've done an incredible job here um, raising money for World Central Kitchen. We've got incredible speakers like Albert uh, who come into this room, uh, you know, for no financial gain at least. And um, they, they spend their time with us to teach us and inform us. And so if you find what Albert saying to be a value or any of these rooms to be a value, please um, consider giving generously to World Central Kitchen. You can, uh, the link for donating is in my feed. I'll put it up in the link. Where you can speak to Carol uh, Strone, who's our uh, director of development. If Carol wants to come up, she should raise her hand and she could be update us on what's going on. We achieved our initial goal of two hundred thousand dollars, and we've got our uh, site set on, um, on, 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 on 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 bigger things. So, at any rate, um, so with that, let's go back to where we were. Uh, let's go to Michael, and then we'll go to Porter. Michael, the floor is yours. Hi, Michael. Hi, George. Uh, thank you for the space. And uh, I like the presentation of, 
or from Albert. Uh, I have a question about, I think the most important chart for me is uh, the number five, the earnings. And I'd like to ask, uh, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate here for Albert. What about if there was a regime change after 2000, and especially after 2010, and there is a new trend in the earnings? In fact, you know, I'm looking at this chart, and I think it's all over the place. There is no trend. This may be scary in a way. So... If I assume there is a new trend with QE after 2010, how does that change the conclusions? Thank you so much, guys. This is a great space. Thank you. Uh, okay, it's a, it's a, you know, I mean, the, I mean, if it's a new trend, uh, then I don't know. Um, but the the, uh, I mean, the the thing you've got to uh, to remember is that this uh, this EPS trend. I mean, it is a trend, and it's. Uh, it it correlates. It's kind of the same as GNP nominal growth. So it's I mean it's not like uh, you know some some kind of fun, fantasy. So Michael, my question would be I mean Leo, as you Michael, I'll try to stab at that. If 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 you think about why that you know first of all let's first talk about the what not the why. Yeah, the chart is kind of messed up on the on uh, on profit margins. So we could say it's extended, but. It hasn't really shown. So we're just talking about trend. We're just looking at charts and say, well, it hasn't really rolled over yet. But then you think about what's starting to happen. And I think earnings are in the process of rolling over, whether it's a function of rising commodity prices and wages and input costs and an inability to uh, pass them on. And or now if we get a slowdown, um, the negative effect of uh, you know, negative operating leverage, obviously in an up cycle margins uh, expand so i guess i'd say if, 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 if you know if if profits do not mean revert over decades they've, they've kind of gone with gdp i think that was the point albert was making if they don't mean revert you got to ask yourself well, you know what's changed what's different now some people will say well in certain industries you've had increasing competition uh, sorry concentration uh, there, there, there has not been um, enforcement of antitrust issues, and increasing concentration leads to stronger pricing power, which leads higher profit margins. So, I tend to think, though, the combination of um, rising commodity prices, input costs, deglobalization, shortening supply chains, rising rising wage costs, um, and also rising interest rates. Because a lot of uh, earnings benefit greatly from declining interest costs, I think that's all going to conspire to drive profit margins down. So that would be my reason. But you're right; if profit margins don't mean revert, that'd be very that would that would mean something very different. But personally, I, I don't I don't believe that to be the case, and I don't think Albert does either. So thank you for the question, now, Porter. Uh, did you have a question, Porter? The floor is yours. Yeah, I, I was sort of, uh, first of all, George, uh, great job uh, on all these spaces. I think, you know, it helps the average retail guy and, and guys who've been doing this a long time just to hear different perspectives and stuff like that. So great job. Uh, the question I had is, is you know, if you look at page six, he's talking about the, you know, peaking profit margins, you know, it's, it sort of ties together with what I've been trying to think about it in terms of, how, how did we think about COVID and how do we think about sales and margins related to COVID? You know, do, do we take a line back to 19 and, and try to look at what's normal, right? And I'll take maybe one of the poster children of, of COVID and I'll take, I'm not involved in the stock, but Dick's Sporting Goods, right? They made $3 pre-COVID, $3.60. Their profit margins was EBITDA margins were 8%. And at the end of 21, earnings were $15 and profit margins were uh, 23%. And so, you know, you've had this huge ramp up in not only revenues and, and EBITDA margins and, and corresponding earnings, you know, so how do, you know, the, my question to him was, how do you think about the other side of 
COVID, right? How do we think about normalization um, in a lot of these trends, like used cars and houses, and you know, especially with the Fed normalizing too. So it's a it's a real exercise of it, obviously the margins were up too because inventories were super low and they could raise price. And and now, as you've seen with Walmart and Target, it, it, the opposite's occurring. And so the question is, is you know, is this Walmart and Target experience from, from the last week is that now the new normal so it's uh it's going to be an interesting year or well, two, I, so. I, 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 I'll, let me take a stab at that and if Al, albert wants to answer just because that was the area i've spent a lot of time on recently to just go back and give people an idea how it's played and your reporter your example is a very good one i happen to know dick sporting goods so the counterfactual question i like to ask people is imagine where the stock market would be and the economy would be if we'd never had COVID and, you know, would it ever have gone up as much as it did? And to me, the answer is unambiguous. No, we pumped in, you know, trillions of stimulus, whether it was stimulus checks or QE, we juiced the whole thing. So COVID was actually a net positive for the stock market in a huge way. You think about at the consumer level, Take a. I happen to know a, a, a well-known um, consumer goods company. They make a, an item found in the kitchen. I'd rather not say what it is, but it's a, it's a, it's a it's a high-end brand name you'd all recognize. And when we had this shift from services to goods consumption, everyone ran out and bought a Weber grill or a Peloton or whatever. And this was one of those items. And the reason I'm talking about this particular company is because I, I have firsthand information of a friend who, who's a private equity company that owns it. And they make a lot of their stuff in Asia. And what he told me was, predictably, when COVID first hit, and you had the whole work from home thing, sales of this company is a kitchen item. They're just booming through the roof. Sales were so strong, inventory levels got depleted. So you had sales way above trend. And you had low inventory levels. So the orders they were receiving in Asia were not just in line with the increased level of uh, retail demand, but also demand from the wholesalers and the retailers to replenish low inventory levels. So you had a double whammy. So what do they do? They start producing more and more. They order more inventory, you know, more semiconductors, pieces of metal, this, that, and everything else. And in a boom tight situation like that, you start even hoarding stuff a little bit. So that's great as long as it lasted. And then about, I don't know, two months ago, kind of in line with some of the retail commentary we've seen from Walmart and Target, all of a sudden orders started to slip. And you're now confronted with what's known as the bullwhip effect. It's not just that retail sales are going down, but the retailers, whereas before they were uh, ordering extra to rebuild their inventories, now that the inventory levels are up a lot, and I have a I have a, I have a graph of this in my feed somewhere. The 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 orders to replenish inventory are also down. So you got declining end sales, you have declining demand to refill inventory. So it's so it's double whammy on the way up, it's a double whammy on the way down. And so now you have companies starting to move to liquidate their inventory, cut price, et cetera, et cetera, and you're starting to see this. So you know, Porter, I'm a whole retail house. I'm not sure what interest you follow, but what you just described are the the, the wonders of uh, positive operating leverage. Um, the movie also does run in reverse, and I personally yeah. believe it is going to be complete wipeout. That what we saw the last few days from the retail companies is just the beginning. So I don't know, Albert. Do you have any thoughts on the retail stocks, Albert? Albert. No, I, I think you know the the uh, the answer was uh, was was in the question of uh, of Porter. I mean, you know, if if you got you know profit margins that uh, that used to be eight percent and they go you know to twenty percent, you know, in 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 some kind of uh, exceptional environment, I mean, you know, they're not they're not going to stay there. So again, I really think there's something incredible that has happened to uh, you know to the economy in in this uh, in this post post COVID uh, recovery. And, you know, there's got to be an adjustment, you know, independently of, uh, you know, of all the, all the things that are uh, independently of interest rates, in the, independently of everything, you know, as, as, um, as this COVID thing is, is over and people return to their, uh, you know, previous life, 
and previous you know consumption patterns you know it things are going to go back to um, you know to to where they were i mean uh, you know they, they cannot be sustained at the crazy level that uh, that we saw last year so you know the, this adjustment itself is you know is is very very significant thanks for that albert much appreciated uh, david um welcome good to see you again david g for your david yeah, thank you very much. Um, I already enjoyed it uh, a lot, your talks. Thank you for that. So my question is, um, what is your opinion, uh, what the market uh, will do when uh, the U.S. government bond yields come down? There are good signs. They are already rolling over. So first, the reason why stocks came down was because yields were rising too fast. Uh, it was not because of recession fear. And now... Yields are coming down. Could it fuel stocks, or is the market straight going into um, positive correlation with yields because of the fear of a deflationary bust? Thank you very much. I think in the in the in the very short term, um, in, in the very short term, if you see bond yields coming down, uh, the market is going is is going to go up because that's I mean the the market wants to um, you know probably wants uh, is oversold and and wants a good reason to uh, you know to rebound. Uh, long term or medium term, uh, I, I mean stocks are very expensive relative to bonds anyway. So the the uh, you know I mean yields would have to come down a very long way. You know to justify uh, you know where stocks are trading right now. So I don't think I don't think you know the bond market is. Um, I mean, actually, I think the bond market could could do very well, and stocks could do very badly uh, for a period of time until the, uh, the the valuation between stocks and bonds is being uh, is being restored. But in the short term, if bonds are doing uh, if bonds are doing better, uh, then you see you probably see a rally. That's what we've seen in the last uh, in the last few weeks. Is that when the bond market was was doing okay, uh, the stocks were doing you know were rebounding, and and if the stocks were rebounding while the bond market was doing badly, then you know it would crash the next day. That's great. Thanks for that. Um, if anyone has any questions, please raise your uh, hand. We're gonna we have a hard stop on this room at four o'clock. We're gonna limit it to two hours today. In the meantime, uh, Carol, good to see you. Um, did you want to update the room? What's going on, Carol? Sure. Hi, George. Um, what I want to take a couple minutes to touch on is this theme that Albert has been talking about, which is the, the breakdown of the breaking down of things that we're seeing. Um, one of the stories that's not been reported much in the press around humanitarian aid in Ukraine uh, is the fact that major international humanitarian organizations have really been falling short of the mark compared to what they typically do in disaster relief zones. So one of the reasons that I've talked about in other spaces is it, that we identified World Central Kitchen is that they have defied all odds and done what some of the organizations you would expect would be making a difference uh, have not been able to do. And every couple of weeks since the beginning of the conflict, I've been checking in with foreign affairs analysts, heads of net NGOs, journalists, uh, you know, to see if if things have progressed in a better direction. And as of today, when I talk to people on the ground in Lviv, uh, you know, there are still warehouses full of aid that aren't getting to people. There are organizations that aren't mobilizing. And World Central Kitchen has managed to work with um, volunteers and local food system workers throughout Ukraine to provide 25 million hot meals to date. And what we have done in this room in Georgia's spaces so far is raise over $200,000 to provide 50,000 or so of those meals. Um, if anybody wants to understand more about why there has been a breakdown in the international humanitarian aid system, just DM me or um, I'm happy to share more. I don't want to take too much away from our scheduled programming. So um, again, I just want to thank everybody who's being supportive because World Central Kitchen is really one of the relatively few bright spots in what in the aid that's getting to Ukrainians. And even our government is not doing what it needs to be doing to get aid to the right people and the right amount. So thank you again. Thank you, Carol. Um, Carol's been uh, Carol 
closely uh, working away on this um, and, you know, the spirit of giving back. We have, there's a, a bunch of us, Carol Strone, uh, Bobby J, uh, RJ, um, Jack, um, this, it's not just me. So, and you're going to be seeing bigger and better things going forward. I mean, we're not stopping at 200,000. So we're trying to figure out exactly where we're going to go, but you know, this is a, this, we have a first world problem in this from figuring out how to preserve and increase our net worth. And there are people out there who really need our help. So thank you, Carol. Um, thank you. Uh, Jackson, my good friend. Good to see you. What's up, my man? Not much, brother. Thanks for having those spaces, guys. Love you all. Um, I just wanted to piggyback real quick on the margins and multiples narrative that I've been beating for six months in here. They're not getting any better, Porter. Nobody, You can charge whatever you want, but because of the inflationary pressures down the supply chains, the margin and multiples are not getting any better anytime soon. I'm going to keep beating my drum until it's raw. Um, so if anybody has anything that is bullish margins and multiples, they're, they're lying. They're not being honest. They're not getting any better. Period. End. Across the board. So, Jackson, um, for those who haven't heard you before, you're in the lodging um, industry, and I always find your comments particularly illuminating around the cost pressures, and you've spoken about how you guys have had to raise room rates, but never let that translate to the bottom line. So, for those who haven't heard you before, get, maybe you can get back up in the soapbox and explain a little bit, you know, what's happening with your room rates and, and, and how it hasn't fallen through to the bottom line. 100%. So some in this room, Porter, uh, Mount Cox, a few others, George, you included. Um, no, I've been with Starwood Capital since 2002 off and on. Um, hospitality driven, um, PE as well, uh, single family homes, etc. But just to give an example, I was just in Miami for our um, post earnings recap. $1,500 a night, ten fifty a bottle of water, $25 for a glass of rosé. And I talked to my GM, and what does he say? We're just barely making rent. Um, nothing is translating. You can charge whatever you want, but at the end of the day, the bottom line comes down to, and the example I use is, I'm not on the operation side, but the example that I use is from my operational team, what they tell me is, is the, the logistics are so screwed, and the fact that if one housekeeper calls out, the whole thing comes apart. You don't have another housekeeper to call. I know these seem trivial, but these are very, very serious things. And I feel sad for the people that are paying $1,500 a night at the hotel when us sea levels are down picking up uh, uh, towels around the pool to keep the place to the standard that it should be. So it's just very frustrating, and, it, and there's, no, there's no end in sight. It is not getting better. The linen companies, I talked to them while I was down there. Everybody across the board is gouging as hard as they can. And it is still not translating. It, it just isn't, folks. Always interesting. It's just amazing. You know, listen to you t t t t repeat that, Jackson. Uh, I think when you were, when we last were talking about this, one of my friends was, was explaining what was going on in some of the hospitals. And when you're talking about the need to get a maid to be able to clean the room or the whole thing falls apart, I remember, I think you responded to this. He was telling me, I think it was in the Jacksonville hospital system. It's true everywhere. Do having to pay some of these traveling nurses like $9,000 a week? $9,000 a week. Because if you don't have the nurse, you can't do the surgical procedure. And that's where they make all the big dough. So it's just a nightmare. And, and also, I think back to two, three months ago, we had Dr. Jim Walker in the room. And this was, early, this was back in, I think it was February. And he was talking about the uh, ex-post versus the ex-ante economy, i.e., we're all used to a certain uh, regimen of um, prices and costs. And if you're an entrepreneur, you can figure out what your income state lo statement looks like, and you can figure out if you're making a profit. And the point he made was, well, the ex-ante world is going to look a lot different than the, sorry, the ex-post world is going to look a lot different than the ex-ante world. That is to say, prices are all over the place. Costs are all over the place. Guys are jacking prices. Nobody really knows if they're making or losing money. He harkened back to his time when he started his career in the 70s. He was an auditor. And for those that aren't old enough to know this or remember this, we had, and Jackson, I'm sure you know this, you know, FIFO versus LIFO accounting, first in, first out, or last in, first out. And when you have prices going up 
in a prodigious clip, it really matters um, which you use. And you can manipulate your earnings depending on whether you use FIFO or LIFO. And so the point Dr. Walker was making was that, you know, companies are scrambling, they're jacking prices just like Starwood is, but nobody really knows what their true costs are. And it's just a mess. And then on top of it, you have other companies that are just using the generalized increase in prices to jack prices for themselves. So that's why this whole business about the Fed having to get inflation under control, it's real because otherwise the wheels just completely come off. So I really appreciate you, Jackson, for bringing those insights to the room because it, it puts to life some of these concepts that we hear about. So thank you for that, Jackson. Let's go to Arnold and then back to Trent Wizzo. Arnold? Thanks, George. Great space. Um, I just want to make a comment to the guy who brought up emerging markets in Brazil and just talk about my experience. So I lived in Rio um, while they hosted the World Cup in 2014. And um, that's when commodities commodities were booming. And it was such a magical place. Lula uh, was president. Um, Ike Batista was a mining magnet who went on TV and said that he was going to be the richest man in the world and overtake uh, Carlos Slim in Mexico. Um, so, you know, with these emerging markets, you really got to see who's in charge. Um, yeah, you know, the guy probably has um, the same belief that we're early in the um, super commodity cycle. But, you know, Lula's running again. And, and um, as tempting as it is, you know, with Brazil being... Um, so strong in, in commodities would I invest in a company like Petrobras which um, is partially owned by the government or like a Pemex right um, that the Mexican company yeah, yeah. No. Or, or, or that's a good yeah. question so, so Billy specifically could you speak to how do you think about the election and Lula likelihood of being reelected being elected and if he is what would that mean yeah, I mean the the uh, I mean the politics are, are going to be uh, are going to be important, um, you know, until the election, which are in uh, in in October or November, I think, and um, you know there there are always lots of uh, upheavals, you know, political upheavals um, until the election. So I agree, it's it's probably going to be tricky uh, between now and then. Um, <clears throat> You know the choice is the, the choice right now is between Bolsonaro, who is uh, you know like a mini Trump, and uh, and Lula, who is uh, who is uh, a convicted uh, felon. So I don't know which one is. Uh, you know I believe that if it's Lula, it could be actually quite uh, catastrophic, um, <clears throat> because there, there would be some kind of uh, revenge, you know, against the establishment. And I'm not sure he's going to be able to uh, to to play again the same, you know, the same. Um, script that uh, that he played very very well in his first uh, in his first uh, mandate so i mean the story of lula was a great first mandate uh, and then a pretty mediocre second mandate and then he was followed by by his uh, successor dilma rousseff and that was uh, you know um, a catastrophe so it's the most corrupted um, uh, political party in the world maybe uh, so you know lula is is, is probably not good uh, not not good news if he was going to be elected, and and the risk in Brazil is that between now and the election, you know the the uh, the polls uh, actually is is ahead in the polls, uh, which is uh, which is amazing. Um, but I'm you know uh, his his lead is coming down, and uh, but I think the market will be worried if uh, you know if uh, if he gets uh, strong again. So um, you know political risk is uh, is certainly an issue in uh, in uh, in Brazil. And um, yeah, I don't, um, I don't disagree. All right, um, let's see who is yet to speak. Uh, or jo Jonathan, go ahead. Hi there, George. Hi there, everybody. Oh. Um, one of the things that sort of jumps out at me at the moment is just the uh, rising household and mortgage debt, and the effect that that will have on expendable um, and disposable income. Uh, I think we're going to find that as supply chain disruption starts to ease, maybe towards the end of this year and early next year, there's just going to be no appetite from consumers to spend money that they just don't have. Yeah, I, I quite agree with that. We've had, um, uh, we had Ian um, Harnett from ASR Research in the room last week. I urge everyone to go to our YouTube channel, listen to the replay of that. 
he's actually uh, calling for a recession because real incomes are being increasingly squeezed by rising prices. And so you're already seeing this in the retail sales. While sales are still up, units are down because prices are up so much. So I think you're right, Jonathan. This is my own view is, you know, whereas, I mean, Albert spoke of, uh, you know, the, he, he said, you know, I think we should have a similar view that before we were wondering about a recession, now it's a foregone conclusion. So I agree with you. I mean, I mean Albert, you think we're looking at a recession, Albert? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my concern is as it tightens into sort of the end of this year and then early 2023 is that with inf- interest rates, uh, you know, what knock on effect is that then going to have on the housing market? And as soon as that starts to slide, yep. then consumer sentiment is 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 very negative and, and people's disposable or at least the feeling of their own disposable wealth is just completely destroyed. Um, and, and that takes us into sort of, you know, really quite quite interesting territory uh, and and the impact that that will have on on equities you know uh, the crypto space all of those um I, I mean people will just start trying unwinding their investments in order to pay their bills into what will be at that point a falling market 100 percent. all right let, let's go back let's go, to glenn, let's go to glenn now hey glenn what's up hey you doing george thanks for hosting uh and albert that was a succinct uh presentation i'm shocked at how many people are just bottom callers so quickly when really we've had 40 years of nothing but lower rates my question for george my question for albert i guess is uh shorting is not for civilians for sure but if you could only love one uh short individual name or index uh what would it be albert uh i guess uh snp i think uh, you know that's the one stop uh one stop uh, shopping for sure. And I guess I'll, I'll still go with Kathy. I, I got to think. Um, you know, I, I've gone through her portfolio, and there's nothing remotely close to being attractive, in my opinion. And I really don't talk about stocks, and you know, I, I try to talk about individual names, and I stay away from the electric car companies will not be named. But I think his time has come. And because he's going to back out of his deal to buy Twitter, I don't mind calling him out right here. Uh, you know, that stock even now, uh, I believe, is selling at around 14 times trailing revenues. And the average auto stock is maybe, I don't know, half of revenues. And, you know, they're starting to rapidly lose market share in, 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 in Europe. And the deliveries have collapsed in China. Yeah, I I think that I think that company's days are numbered. I really do. I, I think that stock will be a hundred. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's price earnings is ninety six. Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. They're not even worth it. Who, so it's who's just they're, so much? Yeah, it's always uh, always been more than a more of a cult than stock. Yeah, yeah, hey, Glenn, Glenn, you got some background noise there. So uh, sorry. Did we answer your question, Glenn? Yeah, it's not me. I don't have any. I'm in a sealed room. <laughs> so whoever else is speaker, but yeah, Arc. I mean, Arc it hasn't even had it outflows yet. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. It's it's people. It's like a suicide mission. All right, thanks for that, Glenn. All right, we're going to go to Shrub, and then we got Mr. Schmuckatelli. Hey, Shrub, good to see you. What's up? Hey, George. Thanks for doing this. Uh, just a quick one, actually. So. I, because um, Albert mentioned his price target of, you know, like could, the S&P could hit like 2,400. And whenever I say 3,600, people panic. Um, so, you know, I'm just impressed that with all the financial software and uh, money people spend on research, they use one-year charts. And they don't do a three-year chart or a five-year chart and just see that the S&P started so why wouldn't the S&P be back to 3,200 where it should be? We're not talking about like, a, how, how is this bearish to be back to where it should be after we just... Shrub, I think you're breaking up on us. Can, not, can you hear Shrub? Both a pandemic, no, uh, potential off. world war, and also... Uh, hey, Shrub, hey, Shrub we've got, you're, you're, you're in the matrix on us. It's kind of weird. Maybe, Shrub, you do me a favor. Can you leave the room and come back? Because, yeah, all right. I think the question was, I'll, I'll, I'll ask it for him. Albert's question we discussed earlier. 
you know, the idea that uh, he was making the case that if the S P goes to thirty two hundred, people will freak out when he says that. But like, that's where it should have been maybe from the very beginning. I mean, like, like the idea that the S P at thirty two hundred, like, if anything, that's sort of that's generously valued or the generous side of fair value, wouldn't you say? I mean, I think that's the question he was getting at. What would you say about trying to figure out where the S and P like should be or what equilibrium might be? Like, how would you think? How would you go about considering that question? Well, you know, it goes back to what I was saying before. You know, whether we go to fair value or we uh, whether we go full, uh, full cycle to undervaluation. So, I mean, the the you know the price adjustment that you you need. You know, just to get to fair value is is probably already you know like uh, let, let's let's call it the top you know the top pre-COVID level, okay. But you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be shocked if uh, if the market was gonna you know was gonna go down to the lows of you know of the of twenty twenty. Gotta pull myself. You know the lows the lows of twenty twenty. Uh, yeah, I was bearish at, on the lows of twenty twenty. I mean, you know, I I. Uh, uh, I thought COVID was going to be the thing that was going to break the market the same way, you know, it's happening right now. And uh, and I underestimated the, uh, the uh, you know, the way the, the central bank and the federal government and the same thing all over the world, you know, the way they, they, they actually, you know, put, put so much liquidity in the system and how much money they, you know, they just gave away to, uh, you know, to people and businesses and so on. But I think, you know, if you take away COVID, I think the market... You know, before before COVID was ready to uh, you know was ready to correct and to go into into some kind of a bear market, and so again, you know, I think I think if you if you you know you you've got to um, uh, you got to accept. I mean, I don't know if you you got to accept. I I, I view things. I, I view the world. Uh, you know, with a different uh, different uh, set of eyes. I mean, I think we are in a completely different environment. Uh, in fact, the, the complete opposite of the last 40 years. And you cannot look at the market or where it's going to go or what kind of valuation or, or what the Fed is going to do. I mean, you can't look at, at the market with the same eyes uh, as you had in the last 10, 20 years or 30 years, you know, um, because it's it's totally different. And so if you accept that we are in a in an inflationary uh uh, environment with you know with uh, you know probably significant decline in 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 world growth. I mean you know th- this is a you know probably a fact. It's a gimme. I mean the uh, deglobalization is something you know that's not going to last for the next uh, you know for the next year or the next two years. It's something that's going to you know go on probably for the next ten years. I mean it's it's the kind of it's the reverse exact reverse of the last forty years, and and this is going to. Uh, you know, this is going to affect, I think, uh, you know, very significantly the way, you know, the way businesses uh, or the, the, the way companies are thinking about growth. Um, and, and, you know, and, and that's in turn, that's going to affect, you know, valuations. Um, you know, I cannot see the environment. Uh, I, I, you know, I basically think that um, uh, in a way, half of the world is, uh, is, is crude, uh, you know, with this Russian-Ukrainian thing. Uh, and and also with China and the behavior of China and trade wars and deglobalization and so on, uh, that that most companies in the world are over, over oversized, you know, for global markets, um, and and you know there's going to be a major, I think, a major retrench, retrenchment of uh, you know of, of business basically, and and things are going to become a lot, you know, kind of a lot a lot smaller, and so the. Um, you know that's why you know my own view is uh, is pretty pretty uh, you know cataclysmic actually. Yeah, and, and Albert, when you t- when you talk about the future not looking like the past, regime change, you and I go back to we met over the Japanese stock market. And in some respects, it kind of reminds me of the peak in the Japanese stock market, where you go through a sustained period of time where tremendous excess liquidity, booming asset prices, uh, up and to the right blah 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 and it kind of reminds me in a way i think you and i had this discussion uh yesterday i mean imagine we're in japan and it's the middle of 1990 and the market's already started to go down and everyone's comparing it to the peak the nikkei peaked at 39,000 last day of 1989 so everyone's looking in the mirror in the mirror saying oh look how cheap it is it's down look how cheap it is it's down no uh-huh. we were entering a brave new world i mean I'm not saying we're going to be Japan, but I'd like to just remind everybody 
the Nikkei bottom at 7,000. And here we are a zillion years later. And where are we? 24,000 or something like that. I mean, no, it's a, it's a total Dorothy. We're not in Kansas anymore. This is different. And, yeah. and, try, and trying to use the revaluation uh, metrics of the past cycle with, with, with and, and looking at the world through rose colored glasses and thinking that we're going to have growth like we did as well. It's just not, it's just wrong. That's and right. Think, that's good. That's he, people are just looking backwards. Is that is that is that the way you look at it? Yeah, no, but that's exactly that's exactly right. And and you know, again, if you look at the Japanese market, it's still you know it's uh, you know thirty years later, it it still continues to uh, to derate, you know. So, yep. so I mean, these are very very uh, you know, uh, you know, I cannot see any environment. Um, uh, actually, I mean, there's only one thing that you know that could. Uh, let's say restart party time maybe for a while is if there if, if you do have a regime change in in russia and, and this whole thing you know sort of uh you know finishes for uh, for now but then you know we'll, we'll probably be soon with you know other problems with china and right. stuff like that and right. and deglobalization anyway is is the uh is the trend of the next uh of the next few years and and that's sure. and, and i think that's a, that's that's a major you know it's a it's it's going to be a major um uh, drag on on uh, on growth, major drag on growth. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And and yeah, I mean, I think I think you know the time of uh, you know thirty times earnings, uh, you know stocks. You know, I was thinking, I mean, you know, I, I I do think that the 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 peak that we've seen in the in the U.S. market in in twenty twenty one, we're not going to see that peak, you know, for a number of of years. And I don't see any environment where. You know the craziness was so. I mean, craziness was so uh, crazy, so extreme. You know, the last last year, the last two years, with you know, with. Uh, um, I mean, cryptocurrency. I mean, you know, cryptocurrency is probably the ultimate. You know, the ultimate craziness. But you know, the memes. You know, these meme stocks. I mean, you know, you and I. You know, in Japan, you, the, you know, there were some crazy stuff, but it it never got, you know, that crazy. I mean, I think the speculation that we've seen. You know, in the last in the last few years, is just you know is is just one you know one in a lifetime, and so after that kind of that you know what what kind of story you're gonna get uh, you you're gonna need to get the market you know back to the all time highs, which is going to overpass the uh, you know the craziness of you know of twenty you know twenty 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 one, you know right. it's it's going to be very difficult to make up you know to make up a better story. Yep. All right. We're gonna last question. Um, last speaker, and and he's again he's a great friend of this room. Tremendous insights. I don't know what he wants to talk about, but I'm gonna ask him anyway because he knows what's coming. So, I think it's Sergeant Joe. I don't know if it's Private Joe Schmuckatelli. He's got the best name on Twitter. So Schmuck, good to see you. Um, I don't know what's top of mind for you, but I do have to ask you the question I always ask you. Give us your update from where you sit, what you see going on in the Ukraine and the whole military situation. Schmuck, what's going on? Hey, George. Thanks for, thanks for having me, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, you know, there was a moment a couple weeks ago where I suddenly became very optimistic. Um, the Ukrainians, their will to fight, their morale, I mean, they're fighting for their lives after all, has really shown to be the difference maker. And uh, the... Uh, the first grade weapons that they're getting from the West, most notably the United States, continues to flow in. And uh, I'll tell you what, uh, time is on their side right now. Uh, I do fear it will devolve into some sort of a stalemate with entrenched positions, with the Russians uh, just maintaining defensive positions in eastern Ukraine. Um, but I'm uh, cautiously optimistic right now. That said, I think that this is a slog and it's going to continue for the indefinite future. I don't really see, I don't really see a resolution to this uh, on the near-term horizon, uh, barring some kind of overwhelming, um, uh, overwhelming uh, campaign by the Ukrainians that's able to to root out the Russians and and just because of uh, of, of material and force placement, uh, that would be a very difficult thing to do right now. But what I I come bearing good news, George. I, What's that? I, I, I come. I, I want to bring some energy into the room, some into this otherwise somewhat somber time. There's there's good news, and I come to bring the good news. There's there's good things happening. There's good companies to invest in. 
There are generational opportunities in Canadian energy right now. I have two companies at the top of my mind that are literally flowing enough free cash, walking away after they've paid all their expenses to buy themselves out within the next two years. Many of these companies are available on the New York Stock Exchange. Others are available in the OTC. I mean, I'm flabbergasted that energy is still only a 4% you know, um, portion of the S&P 500. I'm flabbergasted that the generalist investor has not flooded into the space. I'm seeing reports that a lot of hedge funds are getting more and more interested. I think there could be a tidal wave of money flowing into the sector in the not too distant future. Okay, look, I'm a realist. Okay, and a market downdraft is going to bring down this sector with it, perhaps less so but a market downdraft to me is the biggest risk that the sector faces right now because of the well-known supply demand uh, you know, uh, imbalances that you're well aware of and I won't drag the room through it. So my point is that there's amazing opportunities in energy. Uh, the best energy space right now is in Canada and anybody that wants to do their due diligence can take a look at that space and uh, their eyebrows will probably get burned when they look at the financials. Yeah. And Joe, you and I, you know, I agree with you. I mean, my concern short term has been just the market environment. I mean, listen, I would be long energy short, Kathy, all day long. You know, since last summer, when we first talked about the trade that's up 350 percent. But if you say to me, would I be long energy naked right now? The on the one hand, you've got the outstanding long long term valuation, long term fundamental arguments. And, and the valuation is very cheap and seasonally we're drawing and we're running out of excess capacity. On the other side of it, I got Albert to deal with in the bear market. And so I'm kind of like conflicted right now. So, you know, I, long I, energy, I think that that's a, I think that that's a reasonable position to have. I agree with you. Um, as I stated, I think a market downdraft is a great risk to anybody that's investing long anywhere right now. But that said, when you look at, you know, 112 WTI and China is just only now starting to reopen. Yep. yep. It's kind of it's kind of amazing to look at. But I agree Agreed. with you. I mean, Agreed. people should tread light, lightly no matter where they go long in this market. And by, and by the way, Joe, the last thing you said is really important. I would just tell anyone and everyone, whatever you're doing in this environment with this much uncertainty, do less of it. Because this is when stuff happens. You get bizarre moves that you thought weren't possible. Think the unthinkable. So run with a smaller balance sheet. Don't be on margin. Whether you're bullish or bearish, don't be swinging the bat real hard because there's just too much uncertainty out there right now. All right, with that, um, this is going to be a first for us. It's been weeks, but we're actually going to limit this from the two hours. So I want to thank Albert. Albert, again, for those of you interested in Albert, I mean, Albert, I have to thank you. This was masterful. This is quite a good idea. You were so well prepared. We've never quite had something like this. We, we had all the slides up there at once, and I think it really helped people understand what you were doing. So a big shout out to you. And anyone who's interested in Albert's work, contact him or contact me. You're going to be hearing more from Albert and seeing more of Albert in the coming weeks. Um, I think many of you know we're hoping to get a research product offering out there, and, and it will include Albert. Uh, again, uh, if you found this one to be of value, please contact uh, Carol Strone or myself or up in the nest. There's a link there for World Central Kitchen. Uh, we'll be doing a space again on Saturday. Uh, in the meantime, though, this has been great. And Albert, I want to thank you again. Thank, thank you. Applause, and this has been great. And uh, we'll be in touch. And uh, don't be a stranger. Always, even Albert, when you're, not, when you're not speaking, you should just drop in and offer your comments from the cheap seats. You can be the one throwing the tomatoes instead of you be the one having to catch the tomatoes. Okay. All right, everyone. Okay, thanks, thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.